2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. But we, but we, but this is Christ. Now we're getting back to where Paul is going straight directing to the body of Christ for today. He was talking about the body of Christ with the catching away of the body of Christ. The day of Christ is at hand. And once again, the day of Christ cannot happen until the man of sin is revealed. And the man of sin, the man of sin cannot be real, be revealed till the day of Christ happens. They both go hand in hand. That part was for us to let us know that the catching away of the body of Christ is for us. The day of Christ is at hand. You didn't miss the day of Christ, and, you're, and the day of Christ has to happen before this man of sin can be revealed. We've talked about this. There's already people that say that, you've, that the day of Christ already happened and the man of sin hasn't been revealed. There's people that say we go into the time of Jacob's trouble where the man of sin is being revealed and there is no catching away. Well, if there's no catching away, the day of Christ... There is no man of sin being revealed. You can't have one without the other. But the catching away of the body of Christ was for us. But then he goes, Paul goes into that time period a little bit and starts explaining what we read in here. Uh, verse 4, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4 says, Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. You get over to verse 10, it talks about the people in that time period, where he, he says, And with all the deceitfulness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they might be damned, who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. It's for people in that time period. We've talked about this, if you've been following this series of expository studies. Okay? That strong delusion, the Bible we read about in Revelation, the whole world worships that man. And Paul kind of gets off on it a little bit, going, okay, this is what's going to happen in the time, that time period, and it's going to be used to fearmonger and scare the brethren. And some of you are going to be deceived into thinking that you go into that time period when you don't. Then he goes, but we, what does that mean? He's getting back to the body of Christ. Okay, well, i got to get back to focusing on the body of Christ, but we. Now, brothers in Christ, when you use the word but, when you use the word but, it negates something or it downplays something. Okay? I'll give you an example of this. I'm sorry, but... What is that doing? You're negating the sorry. You're making the sorry like it's nothing. I've seen people do that, brothers of Christ. Well, let's say, I'm sorry, but... They did this, and they did that, and them, and them, and them. They're pointing the finger everywhere else. They're not really sorry. They just negated it with the word but. They're not sorry. Um, the truth. When you preach the truth to somebody, have you ever heard that saying where someone says, oh, that's true, but... And they try to find every reason not to believe that truth. They come up with all these excuses and every reason not to believe that truth. Now that statement when they said that's true, but... Do they actually really believe that's true? No. So but can be used to negate something and make it worthless. Is that what's going on here? No. I believe the but here is downplaying it. Downplaying the importance. You can use the word but to downplay the importance of something. We don't have to worry about what's going on in that time period. Everything we just read there in 10, 11, 12, most of this chapter, there's few, when it's talking about the day of Christ, us getting caught up, and who he who now leth will let till he be taken out of the way, to be not shown shaken in mind or troubled in spirit, when he's trying to encourage them, that's for us. But when he starts going into why we ought to be shaken, because this time period, you don't have to go into it. You don't have to go into it. We got saved. The lost world, we're to preach that they don't have to go into it. We're not going into it. I meant to say we're not going into it, but the lost world, they don't have to go into it. Okay? We're going to get caught up before that. And then he talks about what's going on, and he downplays it. Okay, that's, we let you know about the man of sin being revealed. He sets himself as God to worship, be worshipped as God. God's going to be sending this strong delusion. People are going to buy into it. The whole world's going to buy into that deception that he's God, he's Jesus, he's come back. It's, it's not the time of Jacob's trouble. It's actually the day of the Lord. It's the real Jesus Christ. He's come back. America's mystery Babylon. It's been destroyed. And the, this is Jesus coming back. No, it isn't. But it's that strong delusion. And Paul's going, but we, but, he's downplaying it. We don't have to worry about it. We're not going to be there, brother, says Christ. 
we're not going to see it from down here. We'll probably see it from up there. When we get to go to be with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in heaven. But we're not going to go through that time period, the time of Jacob's trouble. We're not going to get to see the man of sin being revealed. We're going to be gone. Okay? But we, who's the we? Save sinners. Now Paul's like, okay, I'm going to bring it back to this dispensation, the time of the Gentiles, what we are supposed to be focused on. Are we supposed to be focused on that man of sin, the son of perdition? Are we supposed to be focused on the great truth? They call it the Great Tribulation, falsely called the Great Tribulation. It's never used as a title. Title. It's called, in those days there shall be Great Tribulation. I think it's in the Old Testament, I can't remember if it's Isaiah, but it talks about how that day is great, that it says that there's none like it. It might even be in um, Daniel. But it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay. But we, 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 he's getting back to the body of Christ. Okay, what's our importance? What are we supposed to be doing? Here it is. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord. Give thanks. Keep your finger here and turn to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Giving thanks always to God. We're supposed to be giving God thanks in all things, brothers and Christ. Paul's giving God thanks for the brethren, beloved of the Lord. What he's really doing is we keep going. He's giving God thanks for the salvation that we get and how we come to God broken, how we find God's grace in this time period. It's the easiest way to get saved. It's the most simplest way, easiest way, and yet it seems to be so hard. I always tell people, everyone always says it's easy, but it can't be that easy because hardly anybody's doing it. It's, today, it's faith. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. We're going to get into the gospel of today. Today, it's the faith. There's no works added to it. None. In that time period that Paul just got finished talking about, and we went through and compared Scripture with Scripture and explained in Revelation that there's works in the gospel in that time period. There's hardship. It's the worst time in period history. He's thanking God for the brethren, for the body of Christ, for what salvation is today. We're going to get into that. Mm -hmm. But we always give God thanks. We're supposed to give God thanks in everything. You know, the number one thing that I give God thanks for, brothers and Christ, salvation. Salvation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Giving God thanks that we are the body of Christ, we get saved today, the salvation that's today. And we give God thanks that the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, that the day of Christ happens, and we don't have to go through that time period, the worst time period in history. We don't have to go through a time period where there's a man of sin, the son of perdition, setting himself up as God, and the whole world's buying into it, and God is pouring out his wrath on this world. We don't have to go, in th go through it. Praise God. Now, one thing I thank God for is salvation. The second thing I always thank God for is helping me take His Word, giving me His Word, and hiding it in my heart and helping me to live it. Yeah. Let's keep going. Give thanks always to God for you. Back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Giving thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. From the beginning. What's this talking about? How people get saved today, the gospel that's for today, from the death of Jesus Christ to, to the day of Christ, the catching away of the body of Christ, God had planned it from the very beginning. He planned to sacrifice His Son from the very beginning. From what happened to Adam and Eve in the garden, He had it planned. That's what it means by chosen. This is not talking about, oh, you, you were... You're destined to get saved or you're destined to go to heaven. There's nothing anyone can do. That's garbage. This is saying that the way we get saved today, God had it planned from the very beginning. Having chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit. Sanctification of the Spirit? That's another study that I'll be getting into sometime down the road, brothers of Christ. The difference between water baptism and spiritual baptism and how water baptism is not for today at all. It's not for today at all. Okay, some brethren are probably like the Baptists. Oh no, we're still commanded to do it after salvation. No, we're not. 
when Jesus is commanding them to go baptize the nations, he's talking about with the Holy Spirit. We're reading it right here. Sanctification of the capital S Spirit. Remember when um, John the Baptist, he's the only one that's called the Baptist, John the Baptist, he looked at Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And it talks about how he's the one that's going to baptize the world with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Two baptisms. Holy Ghost, fire. Holy Ghost, fire. Water's not mentioned. Why? Because salvation today, there is no water baptism. Okay? Like I said, it's a whole other study. But sanctification of the Spirit, and people who argue that say what, uh, baptism is required for salvation in the book of Acts, there were people getting saved, they got the Holy Spirit, it said they had the Holy Spirit, and they weren't water baptized. What do you do with that? Oh, we just ignore it. There were people that got water baptized and didn't receive the Holy Spirit. What do you do with that? Paul came to them, they were baptized, and Paul laid his, uh, Peter laid his hand on them, Peter, and they received the Holy Ghost. They didn't get re-water baptized to get the Holy Ghost. Water baptism doesn't do anything. It's not how you get saved today, and it's not a requirement for someone after they get saved. It's not. It's a whole other study. But sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. And here it is, verse 14. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Where he called you by our gospel? He just got finished talking about this different dispensation, the time of Jacob's trouble, and how we're not going to be going through it, that the body of Christ gets caught up, the day of Christ happens, the body of Christ gets caught up, he who now let will let till he be taken out of the way. The day of Christ, okay? That no man deceive by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, which we're seeing, and that man of sin be revealed. So the man of sin gets revealed, the, uh, the day of Christ happens. The day Christ happens, it's because the man of sin got revealed. They both happen hand in hand. But he's talking about that dispensation. And what's Paul do? He, gives, he says, okay, now we're going to get it back to today. And the gospel is for today. Our gospel. Why did he say the gospel? Because he's talking about two different dispensations in here. And you've got to rightly divide between the two. This is all for us. But it's not all talking about us. That man of sin, the son of perdition, I won't be here for that. Neither will you if you're truly saved and born again. That strong delusion, I won't be here for that. And neither will you if you're truly saved and born again. So he gets back to our gospel. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. Why is he saying our gospel? Because there's different gospels in the Bible. I remember a brother in Christ did a teaching. I'm trying to remember who it was, but I think it was... Um, Peter Ruckman, he said, there's, so there's many Gospels in the Bible, which one is for us? And the reason we have so many false Gospels today is you've got people taking Gospels from different dispensations in the Bible and trying to link them all up today. And they pick and choose what they want and throw out the rest, and they can create their own Gospel, any Gospel they want. Okay? When Jesus was here in his earthly ministry, it was the Gospel of the Kingdom of Heaven. Today, it's the Gospel of Faith and the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. In that time period, you'll have that same faith in Jesus that we have today in the time, in the time of Jacob's trouble, except works get added to it. Don't take the mark, don't worship the beast. You have to keep the commandments of God. You have to endure to the end, and then you shall be saved. It's a different gospel in the time of Jacob's trouble. And you've got people that cross dispensational lines and take gospels in different dispensations that are not for today and try to mingle it in with the gospel for today. Ephesians 3.1 For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard the dispensation of the grace of God, there's the word dispensation, I'm, I'm going to stop here a second, brothers and Christ, if you're following anyone who's against dispensational teaching, you need to get away from them. They're going to mess you up. They're going to mess this up. Okay. The dispensation of the grace of God. What does that mean? How God is dispensing His grace for us today. How do we find God's grace today? I just told you. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. You don't find God's grace through water baptism. 
You don't find God's grace through uh, circumcision and keeping the laws of Moses. You don't find God's grace by keeping the traditions of, of men, rudiments of the world, the Babel building system, religious systems. You don't find God's grace that way. And you can't lose God's grace today. You can in the time of Jacob's trouble. But today you can't. The dispensation of God's grace, which is given to me, to you, word. It's given to Paul. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, made known unto me the mystery. What did we just read over here in 2 Thessalonians? God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification. From the beginning, it just wasn't known. It was a mystery. God had chosen this time period and had it, he set everything up. He knew what he was going to do, sacrifice his son on the cross. It was just a mystery in the Old Testament. They didn't have a clue. It wasn't revealed till today. Not today, today, but it wasn't revealed until Jesus' time. And even then, they still didn't understand it when Jesus was trying to tell them about it. The apostles. But Paul, when he revealed it to Paul to preach to the Gentiles, that's when it gets revealed fully and completely. As I wrote for a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was, was not made known unto the sons of men. It was there. God had planned it. We were just ignorant of it. Mankind. Not we, but mankind. All the way back to Adam and Eve. As it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. It's capital S Spirit. You know what I love about the Lord real quick, Brothers Christ? When you're reading the Old Testament, you'll find little things in the Old Testament, just little things here and there, sometimes big things, where it's pointing to Jesus Christ, what Jesus Christ was going to do. It's like future prophecy all throughout the Old Testament. What's God doing? It's still a mystery. They still didn't get it. But we can look back and read in the Old Testament and say, hey, this, this could be talking about Jesus. This, this, this is talking about Jesus. It's a future prophecy of how God would save the world today, how the world would find God's grace today. Okay? But once again, it wasn't fully revealed until to, through Paul. Till we got to what's called the time of the Gentiles. From the death of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ, the day of Christ. Apostles and prophets by the capital S, Spirit. Would we read over there? Sanctification of the Spirit. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Notice here when he's talking Ephesians, it's the gospel. He's talking about today. Okay, you say, what about over here where he says our gospel? Is he ta he's talking about today, but he has to say our gospel because he just got finished talking about a different dispensation where there's a different gospel in it. So he has to go, but we, and get back to today and say, well, let me remind you about the gospel that, that's our gospel that's for today. Here it says the gospel. Why? Because he's, he's, all he's talking about is today. He's not talking about the gospel in the Old Testament. He's not talking about the gospel in the time of Jacob's trouble or the gospel in the, in the day of the Lord. He's, talking about the, he's only been talking about the gospel today so he can say the gospel. And they know what it means. The gospel is the gospel that's for today. Verse 7, Whereof I am made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. What's the gospel for today, brothers and Christ? Repentance towards God. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. One of the biggest ways they pervert the gospel today, brothers and Christ, is they take repentance out. There is no having godly sorrow in your heart for sinning against Him. You know, if you're, I keep saying this, if you're sorry for doing something, brother says Christ, you regret ever doing it. You know what? I regret ever sinning against God. I regret the old man. I regret the lost life that I live. I wish I, I, I talked to the God sometimes and said, Lord, I wish I'd have gotten saved sooner. Why did it take me till I was 35? I was a false convert. I was supposedly saved at 12 to 15 years old. And... I was a false convert all my life. I didn't truly get saved and born again. I was brought to the King James Bible at age 35. I was told the true plan of salvation that only can be found in the King James Bible. And I truly got saved and gave my life to Jesus Christ. And since then, my life has never been the same. 
the changed life. The four with all this easy believism where they take repentance out, there was no changed life. I wasn't a new creature in Christ Jesus. There was no new birth in my life. If you're watching this and you've been deceived into easy believism, only believe, only believe, and you've never come to God broken. The Bible says God saveth such that are of a broken and contrite spirit. Broken and contrite spirit? For godly sorrow worketh repentance. Some people will say the ABCs of, of salvation. Admit you're a sinner. No, admitting is not enough. Why? Because godly sorrow is what makes that repentance work. Did you come to God broken? Having godly sorrow for your personal sins. Regret never sinning against God. Having sorrow for the fact that because of my sins, I'm going to hell, and I deserve to go to hell for sinning against Almighty God. Lord, I am so sorry. I wish I'd never sinned against you. I'm wrong. You're right. I'm wrong. And you've come before God broken. That's the number one thing that gets taken out of salvation today. All other Gospels, it's so easy to prove them as false Gospels because they take that out. They'll make repentance going from unbelief to belief. So we can just take it out altogether because we don't have to say believe and believe. Some people say repentance is just admitting you're a sinner. No, it isn't. It goes much deeper than that. The lost world has no problem admitting they're sinners. But are they sorry for sinning against God? No, they're not. They love their sin. Yeah, I'm a sinner. I don't care. I love my sin. That's their attitude. If you've never come to God broken, you didn't get truly saved and born again. There is no back door, which I'm getting ahead of myself. You have to go through faith, the faith of repentance, what real repentance is. You're having sorrow towards a God you've never seen. You're having sorrow for going to a place you've never seen, hell. Because the Bible tells you it's real, you believe it by faith. I've never seen hell. I've never seen heaven. But I believe they both exist. Why? By faith. And at one time I was going to hell. Now I'm going to heaven. Which is Paul's talking about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the day of Christ. We get to go home someday. But biblical repentance has to be there. If it's not there, you didn't get saved. Then you go to belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Second, uh, First Corinthians, is it Second Corinthians? First Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15. Sometimes I get First Corinthians 15. Yep. First Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. What's the believing in vain? No changed life. I always say this, if you have a, someone has a gospel that says you don't have to have a changed life, they have a resurrectionless gospel. If you are not a new creature in Christ Jesus, if there's, a no, if there's no new birth in you as a saved sinner, then you're denying the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul talks about how we are dead with him, we also shall be raised with him. Someone who's truly saved and born again has a new life. He's got the new birth. He's a new creature in Christ Jesus. How can you believe in blame? People have a lot of knowledge. They have the knowledge of what we're about to read here. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Jesus Christ died for our sins. I'm going to get back to that in just a second. According to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Some people have that head knowledge. But it doesn't make it down here. Why doesn't it make it down here? They skip repentance. Someone say you can miss heaven by 13 inches. The Bible talks about people that have a knowledge of the gospel. But they're still going to hell. Paul is saying here you can believe in vain. Why? Because you can have that knowledge of the death, burial, and resurrection, but let's get back to this verse here, how Christ died for our sins. They like to ignore that. Have you noticed how a lot of these easy believism, they'll skip that part? A lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them will skip that part and say how he died 
and was buried and rose again the third day. They don't like that part that says how Christ died for our sins. How Christ died, they'll say how Christ died, some of them. How Christ died, was buried, and rose again the third day. But they leave out for our sins. Some will say that, and then they'll be like, well, where's repentance? Right there. How Christ died for our sins? You're telling me that some guy took your place was crucified on the cross, went through such a horrendous deal, his beard being ripped out, beaten beyond recognition, whipped within an inch of his life, he bled out on the cross, was nailed to a cross, he had to carry the cross while everyone was just ridiculing him, spitting at him, and just mocking him as he's carrying the cross. And then, of course, Simon had to carry the cross the rest of the way for him. Then they nailed him to a cross, and he had to go through all of that because of your sins, and you don't have to have any sorrow for it? You don't have to repent? Brothers, this Christ, if you're watching this and you've never come to God broken, you didn't get saved. You need to come to God broken with a broken and contrite spirit, having godly sorrow for your personal sins. So when you look at the cross, you can say that and mean it. How he died for our sins. He died for my sins. His blood is God's blood and it washed away my sins. The old man is dead and buried at the foot of the cross with my Lord and Savior. And the new man that you see right now in front of you was raised with my Lord and Savior the third day. That faith and that belief needs to be down here. How do we know that? When you get to the next part of the plan of salvation. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. But with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. But, but, why is it? It doesn't negate it. It downplays it. Why? Because the mouth, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When you truly get saved and born again, you're going to come to God. Before you get saved and born again, you're going to come to God and your heart is going to speak. Lord, I am a filthy, low-down, no-good sinner, Lord. On my way to hell, and I deserve to go to hell for sinning against you, Lord. I wish I'd never sinned against you, Lord. I wish I didn't have this wicked body of flesh. Lord, I'm just the wretched man that I am, oh Lord. Oh Lord, I'm just worthless, oh Lord. I'm wrong, you're right. Lord, have mercy on me. Is there no way? Oh, you showed me a way. Lord, I believe in your Son. I believe in the death that He died for my sins. That He was buried and He rose again the third day, according to Scriptures, proving that He is God. It's God's blood that washed my sins away. comes from the heart. Some people can, head knowledge, can repeat a prayer. Now that's the prayer that I pray. I prayed. Your prayer might be something similar. It doesn't have to be exactly the same, but along those lines. But brothers says Christ, it comes from the heart, or it can come from the head. When I was lost, a false convert, I said a prayer for salvation, and it was head knowledge, death, burial, and resurrection. I had no sorrow in my heart for my sins. I loved my sins. I had no problem with most of my sins. Now remember, the laws of God are written on my heart. On your heart too. The, God, the laws of God are written on everyone's heart. So there were some things I did that I knew was wrong through the laws of God that were written on my heart. Conviction. That I wasn't perfect. That I was still a sinner. But there was a lot of sins that I was like, I have no problem with them. I had no problem with Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, anime, satanic style music, sports, okay, drinking. Okay. There's a lot of things I didn't have a problem with. But after I truly got saved and born again, this is what's getting to the next part. The next part is after you confess that in prayer, because as the Bible says, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. But with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. You confess your repentance towards God. You confess your belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And then the next part is you ask God to save you. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
Call means ask. In the Bible in the Old Testament it says, the first time you see call, it says, then men begin men to call upon the name of the Lord. Call, they begin to ask God for help. Remember mankind in the Old Testament, especially today, even lost people today, when do they tend to call out to God or get angry at God? When things don't go their way. When they get into trouble. In the Old Testament, when they got into trouble, what would they do? They asked God for help. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Shall be. People say, well, see, it's guaranteed. But that's after it went through all the key points. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer. And then you ask God to save you. You did everything else right. You came to God on His terms. You didn't try to find a back door. You came to God on His terms, the Bible terms. When you ask Him to save you, He'll save you. He wants to save you. Okay? He wanted to save me. No man, I'm telling you right now, but he will not turn anybody away. There is no man or woman that came to God on his terms, true biblical repentance, belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confess both in prayer, and then ask God to save him. And he looks at him and goes, oh yeah, you did everything right, but I'm not going to save you. There's not one. He wants to save us. That's why he made a way for us to get saved. God's willing that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All heaven sings over one that repenteth. Because that's where it starts. That's where salvation, finding salvation, finding God's grace, that's where it starts, at repentance. Now that being said, brothers and sisters Christ, that's what true biblical salvation is. Sorry, I went into it a little bit, but that's what true biblical salvation is. And there's people that take prayer, uh, repentance out. Oh, it's works. No, it isn't. It happens here. It's not some physical act you do. Repentance happens here. It's sorrow of the heart for your personal sins that you've sinned against God. It happens here. Time and time in the Bible, brothers of Christ, it talks about a heart issue, a heart issue, a heart issue. Then it talks about people who have a head issue. What do you have? Do you have a head issue or do you have a heart issue? It's important. I know some brethren out there, great men of God, that have mocked this issue. They mock it. Well, did you believe in your head or did you believe in your heart? They mock it. Do you have a head issue or do you have a heart issue? Paul's talking about, our, he says, my, our, our gospel, the gospel for today. Thank God for today because we're not going through the gospel. We're not going to have to have, go, have the gospel in the time of Jacob's trouble. We're not going to have to go through the worst time period in history. Galatians chapter 1 verse 8. Turn to Galatians chapter 1 verse 8. I'm going to turn back to... 1 Thessalonians chapter, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Remember, always keep your hand here. But Galatians chapter 1, verse 8. That though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which he have preached, that we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. He's talking about for today, the time of the Gentiles, from the death of Jesus Christ to the day of Christ. If anybody preaches another gospel or an angel from heaven, let him be accursed. How do we know this? Well, getting a little ahead of myself. We'll talk about the angel that, say, that when he comes in the time of Jacob's trouble, not today, not the day of the Gentiles, but in the time of Jacob's trouble, there's an angel that preaches a different gospel. People say, well, see, let him be a curse. No, because Paul's talking about for today. I don't know how many times I've heard people say, well, I had a dream about an angel, or I've seen angels. And they told me to do this, and they told me to do that. And we always go, chapter and verse. Why? Because it's all false. It's all fake. There's angels that, that you can have uh, evil spirits that will come to these lost people in their dreams and give them what they want, offering anything that's false, anything that's contrary to this book. 2 Corinthians 11.4 For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, in other words, it's going on, today, brothers this Christ, the Antichrist spirits in the world today, and today there are so many Antichrists, fake Jesuses, another Jesus. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, there's tons of another Jesus throughout the world today. But there's only one true Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. 
who have not preached, or you receive another spirit, that antichrist spirit, an evil spirit, but you didn't receive the Holy Spirit. When you're not preaching the real Jesus Christ, you're not going to get the, whole, the real spirit. You're going to get a fake, uh, an evil spirit or an antichrist spirit. And today among the professing Christian world, I see the antichrist spirit. They don't have the Holy Spirit, they have the antichrist spirit, this easy believism. The Bible perversions, the evil antichrist spirit behind the Bible perversions. Organized, called organized religion, where it's part of being part of a club. Okay. They receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel. And that's what it stems to, brothers of Christ. They're not following the true plan of salvation. They're offering them a back door to heaven without having to come to God broken in repentance. Oh, you don't have to give up your sins. No, there doesn't have to be a changed life. Oh, you can have the world and the lust of the flesh and still have a free pass to heaven. And know who's lying to them? Satan. Satan and his children. Mary says, you're of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father you would do. He's a liar from the beginning and the father of it. It says his ministers are transformed into ministers of righteousness. There are people out there that are serving Satan. Can they get saved? Absolutely, if they're still breathing. And some have. Very few. Very few. But some have. But most of the time you have people out there, they're preaching another gospel. They're trying to offer a back door where you don't have to come to God broken. They're preaching another gospel, which you have not accepted. You might well bear with him. And if you go further back, like to, I think first two or three in that chapter, it talks about as the serpent beguiled Eve. Who's the him? Satan. You know, depart from me, ye accursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil. The lake of fire, which everyone's going to wind up, all the, I mean, all the lost people, everyone that's in hell, is going to end up in the lake of fire. The lake of fire, who is that created for? Who's the him there? It's Satan. If you go down a few chapters, a few verses, it starts talking about his ministers. Where are they going to end up? The same place, him. If they don't repent and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confess both in prayer and ask God to save them, they're going to wind up the same place Satan's going. The lake of fire. Revelation 14, 6. Turn to Revelation 14, 6. So Paul's warning, be careful that here's the gospel. I gave you the gospel, brothers and Christ, from the scriptures. This is the plan of salvation. You want to get saved? This is how to get saved. Now, if somebody else comes along and tries to mess it up in any way, shape, or form, they take repentance out. Some have taken prayer out. It's only head belief, and they're only belief. It's knowledge. It's head knowledge. It's not belief. In the death, burial, and resurrection, even though they say the word belief, it's no about the death, burial, and resurrection. And they take out how he died for our sins. How he died, was buried, rose again the third day. It's head knowledge. Paul's saying, this is the plan of salvation. Don't stray from it, brother, sister Christ. Stand for it. Fight for it. Live for it. Why? Because we're supposed to be a light to this dark world. That's how you be a light to this dark world. The changed life that comes after salvation. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I almost forgot that. The changed life after salvation. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. People love to read Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You say you sound a little sarcastic. Those verses are very important, brothers and sisters Christ. They are. But these people are, that these easy believism people are misusing them. And how do they misuse them? They refuse to read verse 10. For by grace are you saved. Absolutely. It's God's grace that saves people. Not your faith. They like to turn faith into works. I earned it by what I did. My faith didn't save me. God saved me. By His grace. Now how did I find His grace? For, for by grace are you saved through faith. Today, I had to go through faith to find it. In other dispensations, you had to go through works and faith. In some dispensations in the Bible, you had to go through works alone to find it. But today, how do we find God's grace? Through faith. And not of works. It is a gift of God. 
Okay. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of works is a gift of God. I'm saying it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Here's verse 10. For we are created in Christ Jesus. We are? Yeah. When you get saved, you get a new, new birth. Old man is dead and buried. The new man is raised. For we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Those good works need to line up with this, brothers of Christ, the Word of God. A lot of times you have people say, well, I do this and I do that. We say chapter and verse. I wear my Sunday best and go to, to, go to these battle buildings where you build a building, call it a church, invite both saved and lost to it. Chapter and verse. These are good works. Chapter and verse. When that says, for we are created in Christ Jesus, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, when it says, we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works, those works need to line up with this, the Word of God. And it says, it before been ordained that we should walk in, to, walk in them. It's been before ordained? Were we just talking about the mystery? The gospel for today, it was there from the very beginning, but it was a mystery to people? It had been before ordained? That when someone today, in the time of the Gentiles, that when you get saved and born again, you're going to be a new creature in Christ Jesus? God purges you, the Bible says, you are bought with a price, know that you're not your own. You're bought with a price. You belong to God. He commands, you obey. That's someone who's truly saved. God commands, through His Word, by the Holy Spirit, and we obey the changed life after salvation. God will start cleaning up your life. Don't do this. Do this. Stay away from that. Hold fast to this. This truth. Stay away from those doctrines of devils. Stay away from those lies. Stay away from those sin and wickedness. Stay away from idolatry. Stay away from worldliness. You're supposed to be come out from the world and be separate. God changes you. It's guaranteed. Okay? Now, Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. Repent, believe, confess both in prayer, and ask God to save you. And after God saves you, He gives you a new birth, a new life. And that whole life is about looking for that blessed hope. The Bible says, before I got saved, I was without God and without hope in the world. What's that hope? That I'm going to heaven. This world isn't it. I don't have to deal with this wicked body of flesh forever. I'm not going to hell. I get to go to heaven someday. Either God's going to call me home in death, or He's going to call me home in life at the day of Christ, the catching away of the body of Christ. But that blessed hope is what helps me, more than anything, have that changed life. When God calls me home, that's it. There's no more time to do work for the Lord and to clean up your life. That's it. You go stand before God, and God, and you have to be judged. See, I'm sorry to go off on this so much, brothers and Christ, but it's so important to me. And God puts it on my heart. People today try to say that there's no more judgment. When you get saved, there's no more judgment. Well, the Bible talks about there's still judgment down here. And everybody, it says, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, though, so then every one of us should give an account of himself to God. Jesus Christ is going to judge the whole world, period. Saved and lost. If you're saved, he's going to judge you at the judgment seat of Christ. Your life as a Christian, your whole life as a Christian, not your lost life. The old man is dead and buried. God forgives all that. You're not going to be judged on all that. The moment you get saved, to the point you go home to be with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, like I said, whether it's in death or in life. You get caught up in death or life. When you stand before our Lord Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ, you will be judged on your life as a Christian. And when that time comes, it's too late. Oh, well, well, Lord, let me quickly do this. Let me get this out of my life. Let me clean up this. Let me, I, sh I need to be gospel tracting more. I need to be praying more. I need to be reading my Bible. Let me go back. It's too late. You're supposed to live every day as if tomorrow it's over. We go home. But there's some brethren that aren't doing that. They're, they're like, oh, Jesus isn't coming back soon. And they put everything off, and their life and their walk with the Lord is just so messed up. It doesn't line up with this book. Why? Because they're not living every day as if Jesus Christ could come back tomorrow. That day of Christ is at hand. The changed life. 
One of the biggest motivations for the changed life after salvation is I was taught, at first, I said this, Brother Scott, at when I was first newly saved, I was just glad to be in. You know that I had that saying, you have your foot in the door? I was just glad to have my foot in heaven. Remember, we're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. I'm still here, but I got my foot. You can't see my foot, but I got my foot in heaven. I was just so grateful to have my foot in heaven. If I get a penny, I get a penny. If, if I have to wash the saints of the feet for all eternity, I, I will do that. You know, I, the grunge work. I don't care. I got my foot in heaven. God saved me. Praise God. I don't deserve it. I, I'll do whatever God has me. To. That was my attitude when I first got saved. You know what God said? God was, God was probably like smiling as I'm doing all that. But then God looked at the scripture and said, My son, well, now are we the sons of God? My child, you're supposed to desire a little bit more now. You're supposed to earn rewards. There's the crown rewards. There's also the inheritance. The inheritance is coming back, be able to come back and rule and reign with Jesus Christ, being priests and kings in the day of the Lord. You're supposed to desire more. Get your life cleaned up. Get busy reading this book every day. Get busy praying every day. Pray without ceasing. Okay, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. I need to be staying in it. Then I need to be studying it. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I need to be studying it. I need to be reading it. I need to be adding it, applying it to my hot life, hiding it in my heart, and living it. The ministry of reconciliation. I need to be going out and gospel tracting. When God opens doors, I witness to people verbally. Uh, if I was in a ministry, you could maybe you could have some brethren that can come together, and you can go out actual street witnessing with signs and whatnot. Okay, but we're supposed to be living for the Lord every day. He could come back any day now. I need to get busy living for the Lord. I need to get busy earning rewards. When I was lost, I was earning wages, death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. I was earning wages when I was lost. Now I'm earning rewards now that I'm saved. I'm living for Jesus Christ. Pleasing God is more important than pleasing my body, the flesh. That's one of your enemies. Me, myself, and I, the, the flesh, that is, is, is my number one enemy. My number two enemy is the world. I'm not supposed to be pleasing my flesh. I'm not supposed to be pleasing the world. And I'm not supposed to be pleasing Satan and his ministers, compromising, giving in to doctrines of devils. I'm supposed to be pleasing my Lord and Savior. And Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my words. What pleases God is fearing him, because if you, by default, if you fear him, you keep his commandments. If you're not keeping his commandments, it's because something's getting in the way of you fearing him. You love him. How do you love God? By keeping his word. If you're not keeping your, his word, something, one of those three enemies, is getting in the way of keeping you from loving God. The change life, brother, says Christ. I sometimes, sorry to go off on this for long, brother, guys, please forgive me and bear with me. I sometimes beat myself up, brother, guys. I'm, I'm like at nine and a half years of being saved. And where I'm at now, at nine and a half years, I should have been at two years into being saved, maybe even one year into being saved. It's taken a lot. Some of us have taken a long road to get where we are, brothers and Christ. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's something that happens overnight. Sometimes we can fight our flesh. We give into the flesh and fail the Lord. We get into, into the world sometimes and fail the Lord. Sometimes we get deceived and God has to put us back on the right path by Satan and his ministers. It's, it's been a long road. But I look back and say, Lord, why? I should have been where I am today. I should have been there two years into being saved. And I look back and go, oh, well, I fought you on letting go of some things. Yeah, I got deceived over here and got pulled away there for a while over here. I didn't really put every, so much importance on the blessed hope. I didn't do this. I didn't, And it was a long road. But this is Christ. Focus. Focus on your walk with the Lord. It's the most important thing you have. The Word of God is the most important physical possession you have, and your walk with the Lord. Don't be distracted by this world, by those three enemies. Don't forget why you got saved, who saved you, why you needed to get saved. 
And don't forget who it is you serve. It's not me. It's not your body of flesh. It's not that man behind the pulpit. It's not that other man behind the camera. All right? It's G our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, we're supposed to be servants to the brethren, absolutely serving one another. But Jesus Christ comes first. Your walk with the Lord comes first. How's it going, brothers of Christ? Are you getting deceived by this world? Are you giving in to the lust of the flesh? Maybe you came across this, chant, this, this series of studies and you made it this far and you realized, I never came to God broken. I really didn't have a changed life. My so-called walk with the Lord is based off of a social club. It's based off of just words. Something to think about. Sorry for that. Revelation 14, 6. Now we're going to get into the, the gospel that's being preached in the time of Jacob's trouble. Revelation 14, 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of the heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue, tongue and people. The everlasting gospel. Well, it's just repent, believe, confess both in prayer, and ask God to save you. And when He saves you, He seals you. Remember today, when He saves you today, you are sealed into the day of redemption. What's that redemption? The day of Christ. Okay? And this time period, jump down to verse 12. Here's that everlasting gospel that He's preaching. Here is the patience of the saints. Not body of Christ, not church, saints. Okay? I make that very important. There's no church in the actual time of Jacob's trouble, and there's no, um, and some people say well, there might be church. Church just means called out assembly. There's no body of Christ. There's no bride of Christ in the time of Jacob's trouble. They're saints, just like in the Old Testament. The Old Testament saints, today, if you're truly saved and born again, you are a saint. And then there's saints in the time of Jacob's trouble. Saint just means someone who belongs to God. Okay. Here, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So it's not just the faith that we have today. There are now commandments that are added. And this is an angel saying it. Oh, well, then he must be accursed. No, he isn't. No, he isn't. Why? Because he's not saying it today. He's saying it for the time of Jacob's trouble. Once again, Paul, this whole thing about 2 Thessalonians is that Paul is trying to tell them that we're not going into that time period. Okay? We're not going to see that man sin. We're not going to see him set himself up as God to be worshipped as God. We're not going to see the whole world worshipping as God. We're not going to see that strong delusion and have to fight off that strong delusion. We're not going to be there for that, that, that new gospel that's in that time period. It's a different gospel than today. There's some things that overlap. The faith of Jesus is the same. But there's commandments of God. And I like to say this because I'm trying to help you, brothers and sisters of Christ, out. When it comes to Hebrews, when it comes to 1 and 2 Peter, when it comes to James, and I might have missed one, but those, when it comes to these books, I believe it's talking about the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. Is the faith of Jesus the same? Yes. Because some people get confused because they say, well, it says this, the gospel that's for today. They say part of the gospel is for today, the faith of Jesus Christ. But then it goes in and talks about how people can be blotted out. How people can lose, you know, not really lose it, but they, they lose their chance at getting salvation. They can't get salvation anymore while they're still breathing. Okay, uh, Second Peter talks about how you can deny the Lord that bought you and you wind up going to hell and the lake of fire. That's not for today. It's the gospel that we just read there. People get so deceived by those books because I got yelled at by these easy believers and people who don't seem to know the word of God. Well, you got to have the Holy Spirit to know the word of God and then you've got to submit yourself to God saying, Lord, show me what I need to see, not what I want to see. That's another good, a very good point that a brother made once. What I need to see, not what I want to see. Okay. But they get so confused by that. Why? Because the gospel, the faith of Jesus is the same as what we have today. It overlaps, but now there's works added to it. James talks about faith without works as being dead alone. What is that talking about? 
You can have the faith of Jesus, but if you don't keep the commandments of God, that faith is worthless. Being alone. What is that talking about? It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Now for instruction in righteousness, some people don't seem to get it. True faith, when it comes to examine whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. True faith, there's going to be good works that follow. When you truly get saved and born again, you're given a new life, and good works have before ordained. Let's see, for ye are created in Christ Jesus unto good works, Ephesians 2.10. That before ordained that you should walk in them. Good works are going to follow true faith. It's evidence of the faith. It's not that you have to have works and faith to be saved. You get saved through faith, and then good works follow, proving that you had that faith. That's evidence of that faith. In the time of Jacob's trouble, you're going to have faith that gives good works, but you're going to have faith and a separate set of works that you have to keep. They go hand in hand. One is worthless without the other. Kind of like the day of Christ and the man of sin being revealed. You can't have one without the other. In that time period, you can't have the faith and not keep the works, the commandments of God. You can't try to keep the commandments of God, like not taking the mark of the beast and worshiping them, because there might be some who don't take the mark and worship the beast, but they never have the faith of Jesus. You have to have both in that time period. There's a different gospel. So why God? Why did Paul say our gospel? Because he's getting back to this dispensation. He's bringing the church, and he's right to him. He's bringing, okay, I need to bring you back to the today and get you focused on today, not on tomorrow, the time of Jacob's trouble. Back to today. The day of Christ will happen, and then God will take care of the time of Jacob's trouble. Brothers says Christ, let's get back to today. Let's get back to the work that we're supposed to do today. Okay. Turn, us, uh, get, turn back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. Therefore, brethren, this is how we know he's trying to bring us back to the gospel today and get back to remembering how we got saved today and what work needs to get done today. Don't worry about the time of Jacob's trouble. Don't get distracted by it. Don't get entangled with the affairs of this life. Who have chosen him to be a soldier. Don't get entangled with the, how, the, what's going on in the world. God will take care of that. we got a job to do, and we need to stick to it. Therefore, brethren, save sinners, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Stand fast. We're going to get into that stand fast and hold the traditions. The gospel to today is what we're supposed to be fighting for. We're not supposed to be preparing for the time of Jacob's trouble. We're not going to go into it. We're not supposed to be hunkering down and hiding in the woods and hunkering down and saving up all, stocking up on all this food and, and trying to endure to the end to be caught up. You know what you're doing is you're acting like you might be go through the time of Jacob's trouble. Is what you're acting. You have some brethren who claim they still believe in the pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catch away the body of Christ, but they start talking post mid and trib, post and trib, I say post and mid trib, and they start acting like it. They're too busy trying to protect and hide and protect, and we gotta endure, and they're not getting much done for the Lord these days. They're not. Okay. We're supposed to be fighting for the gospel today. We're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope. Stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or epistle. Where is Paul saying we have to endure to the end, to be caught up? He's not. He's saying we need to stand. He warned us about the falling away, that there's brethren falling away from the truth. They're falling away from the day of Christ being at hand, and they're falling, ultimately they're falling away from looking present tense every day for that blessed hope. But we don't have to endure to the end, and then shall you be saved. And some, some brethren are acting like that. No, I'm saved right now, and I need to be living like it, and I need to be a light to this dark world, and I need to be preaching the gospel. I need to be witnessing. I need to be giving out gospel tracts. I need to be preaching the word. I'm, I might already have this in the notes, and I'm getting ahead of myself, where it says preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. The hard times, out of season, the hard times. We don't hunkle down and start hiding because it's hard times. It's, some brethren have the attitude, it's every man for himself. Because we're going to be going through some hard times, they start having the attitude of every man for himself, and they stop loving their brothers and sisters in Christ. And being a servant to their brothers and sisters in Christ. 
No, we're supposed to preach the word. We're supposed to be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Do not be distracted by the signs that are leading up to the time of Jacob's trouble, brothers and sisters Christ. Don't. Paul's saying, therefore, brother, he brings it back to us. We got our gospel today. That's what we need to focus on. And we have what Paul taught us how to live a life of Christ. Take God's word, hide it in our heart, and live it. And be a light to this dark world. The good things we're supposed to be doing. The work, in other words, I always say the mission doesn't change, brother, sister Christ. The mission doesn't change, no matter how bad the world gets. We see things going into the time of Jacob's trouble, like getting prepared for the time of, excuse me, time of Jacob's trouble. Forgive me. We see things being prepared for the time of Jacob's trouble. We're not supposed to let that deter us from the mission at hand. What's the mission at hand? We're to obey the gospel. We're to preach the gospel. We're to live the gospel. We're supposed to be a living witness and a verbal witness. We're to stay in the Word of God daily. We're to pray daily. You should be singing at least one hymn every day, brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to be singing hymns. We need to try to get into some fellowship. The Lord blessed me with, with a great fellowship group. And we have hymn night where we sing some hymns. We have a Bible study night. And then we have a prayer night where people come together with testimonies, confessing their faults one to another, giving some testimonies, whether they're testimonies on don't make the mistake I made, because that can be a good testimony, or God did this great thing in my life testimony. Okay, And we come together. Fellowship. If it's possible, if it all be possible, it wasn't always possible. There's times where I went without fellowship for good, good times in my life. But if it's there, that's what we're supposed to be doing. Encouraging one another. Exhorting one another. Correcting one another. Holding people accountable to that narrow road. This book. That walk with the Lord. We're supposed to be battling the three enemies. We're not supposed to be... I'm sorry, I'm going to go off on this. We're not supposed to be battling... The time of Jacob's trouble. Doesn't it seem like that sometimes with some of the brethren? It's like they're battling something that they're not even going to go through. They get so distracted by the lost, by the time of Jacob's trouble. What's going on in the world as it's heading up to the time of Jacob's trouble. They're trying to find ways to battle the time of Jacob's trouble. Well, we might go through some hard times, so I need to stock up on food. And, you know, and i got to move out of the cities and i got to go live in the wilderness. It's like they're trying to battle the time of Jacob's trouble when if they're truly saved and born again, they're not going to be there. I'm not. But this is Christ, you're not. What are we supposed to be battling today? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood? I'm getting ahead of myself. But the three enemies. I just talked about it. The flesh. We're supposed to be battling the flesh. What happens when you get distracted by the world in the time of Jacob's trouble? You stop battling the flesh. We're supposed to be fighting the world, spiritually, by preaching the gospel, by preaching truth, by living a life that's separate from the world. I'm not going to live that way because it goes against God's word, it's wickedness, it's sin, it's evil. I'm going to stay over here where God has helped me be holy. Be ye holy for I am holy. Sanctified by the Spirit. I belong to Him. I represent Him. I'm a good ambassador for Jesus Christ. An ambassador is someone who's in a foreign land. It's not His land. We're in this world, brothers of Christ, but we're not. This isn't our world. We're not of this world. We're in it, but we're not of it. We're ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Our home is up there. Remember, Jesus is up there preparing a place for us. I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house, there's many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And I'm still trying to memorize that one. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you. Talking about where Jesus is going to come back and get us and take us to our real home. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Uh, Satan, the third enemy. Satan. Those are the three enemies that we're fighting. And you can get distracted from that fight, the good fight, being a good soldier for Jesus Christ, when you start getting distracted by the world. And as it's leading into the time of Jacob's trouble, Paul's bringing us back to today saying, we need to focus on today. God will take care of tomorrow. We need to focus on today. We need to focus on the time of the Gentiles. We need to get busy doing the work of the Lord. We need to get busy living for the Lord. We need to get busy pleasing God. 1 Corinthians 6.13, we read, Watch ye. Stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. 
Watching? Oh, we're supposed to be watching for the time of Jacob's trouble. No, we're not. The watchy is the, we're looking for that blessed hope. The Bible says looking for that blessed hope. What are we supposed to be watching for? We're watching for that blessed hope. We're keeping our eye on the enemy as far as them trying to hinder the ministry for today, the work we need to get done today. We keep our eye on the enemy. And we're looking for that blessed hope. But our eyes are not supposed to be on the time of Jacob's trouble. Our eye is not supposed to be on the world and how it's going to turn into the time of Jacob's trouble. Our eye is supposed to be on that blessed hope, Jesus Christ, looking for Jesus Christ. And we're supposed to be ever watchful at the enemy coming in trying to destroy that. Us looking for that blessed hope. Stand fast in the faith. Brothers and Christ, there's some brethren that have turned their backs. The day of Christ isn't at hand. We don't have to look for that blessed hope. Instead, we've got, we got to get distracted by what's going on down here. No, stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. Stop acting like little children. Brothers and Christ, when you get saved, you're going to be a babe in Christ. But I had a brother in Christ talk to me, and we talked about this. Uh, Brothers and Christ, when you're a babe in Christ, you're not supposed to remain a babe in Christ forever. At some point, you become a man or a woman. Quit you like men. You need to grow up and be a mature Christian, strong in the faith, knowledgeable of the Word of God. Strong prayer life, strong Bible reading life, strong hymn life, singing life, a strong fellowship life if God opens doors, strong witnessing life. Okay? You can't be a babe in Christ forever. Turn to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. The reason I threw this in there is because we just got finished talking about how the gospel is different in different dispensations, and the gospel for today, we've told it. Repentance towards God, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer, and ask God to save you. Four steps that has to do with going through faith. You can't skip any of them. You skip any of them, you will not get saved. God won't save you. God will look at the heart. Galatians 5.1 Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Christ hath made us free? What is that liberty? He freed us from the law of sin and death. Death gets dropped. We're still under the law of sin. There's still consequences. If I live after the flesh, I shall, you shall die. There's still consequences for sin down here. But the eternal consequence, the law of sin and death, death gets dropped. I don't go to hell. I can fail the Lord from time to time. The Bible talks about how you have some people who get saved, and they be, they're, they're worthless as Christians. Paul says, God knows them that are His. And in God's house, there's not only vessels of gold and silver, but wood and earth. That vessel is people. Your body is a temple for the Holy Ghost. And in God's house, there's not only vessels of, of, of gold and silver, but wood and earth. Some to honor, some to dishonor. But they're not going to go to hell. If you're truly saved and born again, that's what that liberty is. You've been free from the law of sin and death. You know, this is talking about when we get through here, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What's this talking about? Galatians. They tried to bring him back under the Old Testament. They tried to bring him back under the law of sin and death. They tried to steal their liberty. No, I'm under the law of sin, but I'm not under the law of sin and death. Stop bringing me back under the law of sin and death. In the time of Jacob's trouble, they go back to being under the law of sin and death. That word, the, the death part doesn't get taken away until they endure to the end, and then they shall be saved. Then they are liberated from the law of sin and death. But they don't get the liberty that we have today. They don't have it in the time of Jacob's trouble. So why do you say stand fast? Stand fast, because today, a lot of the false gospels, they're grabbing from the Old Testament, or they're grabbing from the time of Jacob's trouble. Sometimes they go to the Old Testament, the, when Jesus is preaching the kingdom of heaven, the Sermon on the Mount, and it's talking about the day of the Lord. They're grabbing the gospel from the day of the Lord and trying to apply it to today. They're making a whole mess of stuff. There are different gospels in the Bible. I, I showed you the one that's for us today, brothers and sisters. 
But when you have people that are saying, oh, the day of Christ doesn't happen, and but the, the man of sin is going to be revealed, but the day of Christ doesn't happen, and the body of Christ goes into that time period, they're lying to you. They're not standing fast in the faith. They're not standing fast, where, therefore, in the liberty with, with, wherewith Christ hath made us free. They're trying to send you into another dispensation that has a different gospel. Don't fall for that, brother, says Christ. God will take care of the time of Jacob's trouble. We need to deal with the time of the Gentiles. We, God has given us a mission to live for Jesus Christ today, to be a living witness and a verbal witness, a light to this dark world, and that's what we need to focus on. That's what we need to focus on, brothers and Christ. Sorry this is a little bit long. I said this liberty, once again, if you're truly saved, no sin will keep you from getting saved or cause you to lose salvation. The liberty that, that you can have today, no sin will prevent you from getting it. In the time of Jacob's trouble, you take the mark and you worship the beast, you can't get that liberty. Never. Even while you're breathing, you can't get saved. Today, anybody can get saved no matter what your sins are. No matter what your sins are, God can grant you that liberty. And nothing you can do as a saint, like once God grants you that liberty, there's nothing you can do, failing the Lord, that will cause you to lose that liberty. All right. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Turn to Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I came to see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. One, one mind, striving together, one spirit. Paul talked about if anybody uh, gets you to receive a different spirit. Paul says we're, be we're to be of the same mind and of the same judgment. Be careful, brother, once another warning. Be careful of men who preach that there's things we can agree to disagree when it comes to the Bible. They're not good stewards of the Scriptures. Okay, they're wrestling the Scriptures to their own destruction. The Bible says we're supposed to be of the same mind, the same judgment. Now, here's the thing, brother, right? Are we going to butt heads from time to time? What God showed me, is that person ready to see it? What God showed him, am I ready to see it? But we all are supposed to be on the same page. We're all supposed to be in 100% agreement when it comes to the teachings of this book for today. Or teachings that are talking about a different dispensation. When it comes to this book, the Word of God, the Holy Scriptures, we are supposed to be of the same mind and the same judgment, striving together for the faith of the Gospel. Philippians 4.1. Turn to Philippians 4.1. Therefore, my beloved... My, therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved... And longed for my joy and crown. Almost sounds like what he's saying here. Okay. Therefore, brethren, stand fast. Was a fourteen. Where unto he called you by our gospel to obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or epistle. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and longed for my joy and crown. My brethren, that's by our gospel. The gospel we got saved today. So stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Stand fast in the Lord. There we see it again. Stand fast. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. Some of you know this one. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Remember what I said? We're battling the three enemies, putting the flesh down, separating ourselves from the world, and undoing all, as much as we can what we can do, undoing the deception that Satan's putting in the world, the lies and deceptions that he's putting, the doctrines of devils. We're out there to preach the truth. That's the battle. That's what we're fighting. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and have it done all to stand. Stand, stand, stand. Don't faint. Don't falter. And we, I'm not going to go into this too much, but it goes into the whole armor of God. We've talked about this. If you followed this series of studies, that if you take off one piece of the armor, it's usually the shield. It's the first thing to go. You put down that faith. 
I know brethren who put down that faith that the day of Christ is at hand. That we're to look for that blessed hope. They put down that faith. What happens? Then they start taking off the rest of the armor. Then they get taken out by the fiery darts of the wicked. They're no longer re wrestling against flesh and blood, or, uh, but against principalities. They're not wrestling against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. They're not. They're not fighting the good fight anymore. Be careful of that. Okay, stand, stand, stand. We just read that. They, they all. Uh, Therefore, my brethren, stand fast. Stand, stand, stand. In Second Thessalonians, go ahead and turn back to Second Thessalonians chapter two. We're going to get into verse sixteen. We're almost done. Almost done. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Everlasting consolation? 1 John 5.13 These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Everlasting consolation? When you get saved, we are sealed into the day of redemption. Ephesians 4.30 And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed into the day of redemption. When I was without God, I didn't have that seal. Remember, when I was lost, I was without God, without hope in the world. And the last part of that verse said, good hope through grace. What's that good hope? First Ephesians 2.12, that at that time you were without Christ. There was a time I was without Christ. We all were, brothers and sisters Christ. Sometimes we forget that. I'm not trying to say resurrect the old man. We're not to resurrect the old man and how we live. But sometimes we forget God saved us for a reason. Why? Because I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner that deserves to go to hell. What was life like before I got saved? I was without God and without hope in the world. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. It's one of the things I thank Him every day for saving me. For never giving up on me. Even though I gave up on Him several times in my lost life when I was in my search for truth. I gave up several times, but God didn't give up on me. Praise God. That at, this, at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Without no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. What does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? Looking for that blessed hope, the changed life. That's what the changed life is. When you're looking for that blessed hope, you're going to change your life to please God because He could come home at any moment. Okay? Sometimes I liken it to kids. Parents, when I was old enough that I was supposed to be responsible, we could be left home alone and we're doing things and we got told why they're gone. I need you to do this. I need you to do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. And you have kids that have behaved. They get the stuff done. They don't do the things they're not supposed to. But sometimes you have those kids that misbehave. And all of a sudden you hear the car pulling up in the parking lot. Oh, we didn't do, we didn't clean this, we didn't do that. We did, oh, we were, we're, we're out here wearing candy galore and drinking sodas after we were told not to. And, and we got all the evidence here and everything. Well, we got to clean it, we got we to do it. It's too late. Parents come walking right through the door and catch them. That's going to be what the day of Christ is going to be like for a lot of the brethren. They're going to get called home when they least expect it. And their life is not going to be the way it should be. And that's my exhort exhortation to you, brothers and sisters Christ, to examine yourselves. If God came back today to take you home, are you ready? Can you say like Paul, uh, Paul did, I fought the good fight, I've run my course, I've lived my life for the Lord, I've pleased Him, I am ready to go home if God takes me home. Can you say that? All right. That's where we get to have no hope and without God in the world. What is that hope? That blessed hope. Some of you know what that is. That blessed hope. Titus chapter 2, verse 12. Titus chapter 2, verse 12. Remember, you can always pause and turn. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Like I said, when Jesus comes back, he's going to catch some people doing that. When Jesus comes back, he's going to catch some people that aren't teaching, that we're called to teach. Okay, Husbands are to wash their wives by the watering of their word. 
husbands and wives are to raise their children in the admonition of the Lord. Some men get called into ministry to teach and to preach. And God calls you, you start preaching, you start teaching, but something happens in the world and you stop. Lust of the flesh. Worldliness. Satan gets in the way. Remember, Paul, Paul would say sometimes Satan hindered us. He's trying to do the work of the Lord, but Satan hindered us. I wanted to come to you, but Satan hindered us. Okay? Denying ungodliness. God's going to come back and find some people in, in ungodliness. Save sinners doing ungodly things. Idolatry. It says in worldly lust, Satan, Jesus is going to come back and find some brethren that are getting into the flesh. Lust of the flesh. They're not sober. They're not living righteously and godly in this present world. Why? Because you're not looking, verse 13, looking for that blessed hope. You've taken your eyes off Jesus Christ. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. All iniquity. Today, present tense, I'm still in this wicked body of flesh. There's every day I've got to come to God and say, Lord, forgive me. God's, the Bible says if we repent, God is faithful to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I need to repent on a day-to-day -day basis, brothers and sisters. Sometimes my thoughts stray and I start thinking of things I'm not supposed to be thinking about. Sometimes there's those times where you get tempted and you choose to sin and you actually start indulging in things physically. But a lot of times when you get your life really good with the Lord, don't let your guard down because that's still sinning when you think it. That's still sin. That's still wickedness. But there's going to come a day where He's going to redeem us from all iniquity, this wicked body of flesh, and purify unto Himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort, and when someone's against it, rebuke them. Are you looking for Jesus Christ? I'm looking at your life, brothers. I'm not. Do you know who you are out there? I'm looking at some of the brothers in Christ, brothers and sisters of Christ out there. Uh, your walk with the Lord isn't doing so good. Are you looking for that blessed hope? Oh, well, you know, we don't have to look for it because it's not going to happen anytime soon. I rebuke you. The day of Christ is at hand. We're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope. It could happen tomorrow. You're not ready for it, and you need to be. Rebuke with all authority. All authority. Let no man despise thee. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1-2, through 2, it talks about the blessed hope. Once again, if you went through the first part of this series, okay? Now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that's the blessed hope, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word. In other words, what's the troubling part? We already talked about it. They're not going into the time of Jacob's trouble, but there's someone telling them that you've missed the catching away, that blessed hope, or it's not going to happen before the, time, the man of sin gets revealed. But it says that you be not soon shaken in mind and troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. The day of Christ is at hand. Brothers says Christ, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17. That blessed hope, are you looking for it? With the life that you're living? How's your walk with the Lord going? You know, your prayer life, your Bible reading life, your Bible studying life, sanctification. How is your fellowship? How are you treating the brethren? Some of, the, some of you out there are, are, are failing the brethren in how you're treating one another. If a brother has to be kicked out because of a doctrine of devils, or he has to get kicked out because of lust of the flesh, he has to get kicked out because of idolatry and worldliness, he's still a brother in Christ or sister in Christ. You're still a love him. You still love them. But today, brothers, you, a lot of you are failing. You're, you're showing hate and bitterness. That's not how we're supposed to be. He said, but admonish him as a brother. You have to treat him like the lost world. You're to still treat him like a brother in Christ. Second Thessalonians 2.17 Talking about the blessed hope. Comfort your hearts. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17. Comfort your hearts. We're not going into that time of Jacob's trouble, and we didn't miss the catching away. That's supposed to be a comfort. 
Someday, God is going to call us home. That's a comfort. Some day, God's going to redeem us from this wicked body of flesh. That's a comfort. He's going to take us home before the time of Jacob's trouble. That's a comfort. Comfort your hearts. Establish you in every good word and work. You will not be much, you will not be much use for the Lord, good word or work, if you are fearing and getting distracted by the time of Jacob's trouble. The comfort is, we don't go into that time period. Stop getting distracted by it. Focus on today. When you get distracted by what's going on in the world, as it's leading up to the time of Jacob's trouble, you're not going to have good words and you're not going to have good works. It's just that simple. You're going to be too busy trying to survive until the end. Or you get into the drama and the gossip about what's going on in the world. And you start straying from this. From what God has for us today. Colossians chapter 2 verse 1. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as I have not seen has, has not seen my face in the flesh. In other words, there's some brethren that he wrote, they've heard letters. Sorry about that. Um, letters. They've never seen Paul face to face. They have only know Paul through his letters, his right, when he writes some letters. They only know of Paul through other brethren who talk about him. But they've never seen him face to face. Verse 2. That your hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love. There it is again, being knit together in love. There's not supposed to be division in the body of Christ. There is no we can agree to disagree on anything. We're supposed to be knit together in love. Yeah, I see a lot of hate and bitterness among brethren in the body of Christ, one towards another. See, you get distracted by the time of Jacob's trouble. You're getting distracted by what's going on in the world. You're giving into your flesh with it gets to the debating and, and backbiting and whispering and bearing false witness, railing for railing, mocking, name calling, and er, er, the drama, 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 drama. And that just festers bitterness and hate towards one another. Knit together in love. And unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding. There's that full assurance again. What? I'm sealed into the day of redemption, and I'm not going through that time of Jacob's trouble. I'm going up. I have that assurance from Jesus Christ. God manifests in the flesh. When it's my time, I'm going home. Until then, I'm to live for Jesus Christ down here. Patiently waiting for when it's my turn to go home. My real home. I always say my home away from home. To the acknowledgement of the mystery of God. The salvation that's for today. And of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The Word of God. You get saved, the Holy Spirit comes in, opens the Scriptures to you. True plan of salvation. And through the Scriptures we can learn what the Godhead is. We can learn about the, uh, the day of Christ. The catch away of the body of Christ. Okay. That we want the assurances, the comfort. Verse 3, in whom are hid all the treasures and wisdom of God. Verse 4, and this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Oh no, the body of Christ goes into the time of Jacob's trouble. They're a liar. Oh, the catch, the catching away, the day of Christ, it already happened way back when, and, and the day of the Lord already happened, and we're just waiting for that man's sin to be revealed. They're liars. You can't have one without the other. They're liars. Getting you focused on the time of Jacob's trouble. That's not someone who's, who's serving God. Right? We're supposed to be focused on the here and now. The, the mission that God has for us. We're supposed to be fighting the good fight when it comes to the gospel. We're supposed to be fighting the good fight when it comes to the word of God. Hiding it in our hearts and living it in our own lives. And encouraging the brethren to hide it in their hearts and, li and live it in your lives. The ministry of reconciliation. Okay. How do Comfort your hearts. We did that one. Comfort your hearts. Go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17. Comfort your hearts. The catching away of the body of Christ is a comfort. 
that we're not going through the time of Jacob's trouble is a comfort. And it says, establish you in every good word and work. 2 Timothy 3.16. Some of you, a lot of you have this already memorized, praise God. If you're new, it's a good one to get memorized. But it says, all scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Good works. How do we get those good works when it says, establish you in every good work and work? You've got to be established in this. Rightly dividing. 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing. What's for us today? Mainly the Pauline epistles. This is where you get your good works. How we're supposed to live for God. Some people are taking things out of context and misusing them and applying things to today that's for the time of Jacob's trouble. Applying things to today that's for the day of the Lord. Applying things today that's for the Old Testament. Be careful. This will tell us, but you have to rightly divide. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, and for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Verse 10. For we are created, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. The Holy Spirit comes in opens this book to you, and tells you how you're supposed to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. The do's and the don'ts. The faith that we're supposed to be standing in. And one of those faiths for this topic here is the blessed hope. The day of Christ is at hand. Are you living every day as if Jesus Christ could come back tomorrow? I always say tomorrow so I, because it motivates you to get done today. Because Jesus come back tomorrow. When he comes back tomorrow, there's no more time to do anything. Are you busy living for Jesus Christ every day? Brothers and sisters in Christ. How are you? Mm -hmm. There's work to be done. That's what Paul's saying. Don't get distracted by the time of Jacob's trouble. Focus on today. There's work to be done. Get busy. Get busy. Mm -hmm. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, through this whole study, I've had some brethren disagree with me on some things. By all means, make some comments. If it's a small disagreement, if it's a big disagreement, by all means, brothers and sisters Christ, please email me. Okay, I'm not above correction. you got to use the scriptures. Email me. Okay. Show love for your brother and sister Christ by correcting him with the attitude of trying to get him in the right path. Like I said, do not, do not email me just calling me out. You're a heretic. You're a fault. I'll delete the email without reading it all. Brother, what about this verse? Brother, you said this. I, I, don't, I don't quite get that. I've been told this. Or what about these verses over here? You come with the attitude of, I'm your brother, I love you, but let me show you some things. Something that just doesn't add up to me. I've done that with people, and I've had brother do that with me, brother says Christ, and I've been wrong sometimes. I've been wrong. I've had brother hit me up and say, where's that in the scriptures? And I look all through the scriptures and can't find it. I was like, oh, I'm parroting something someone else said. I have been wrong, brother says Christ. But the proper way is to come in a brotherly way with brotherly love and with the scriptures, and get into fellowship saying, what about this, what about that, and get to talking about the Bible, and trying to iron out our differences without us butting heads. You know why people butt heads a lot of time? Pride. They don't have love for the brethren. I will leave you with this at the end of this whole series of studies. I'll leave you with this, brothers Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. And the servant of our Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. Apt to teach, patient. That's something I'm working on, brothers of Christ. I'm trying not to strive. My goal is not to strive, not to cause division. But be gentle unto all men. That includes the lost world, but for what we're talking about here with the body of Christ, when it comes to preaching and teaching, my goal is not to divide, not to cause drama. I'm trying to preach God's word. I'm trying to serve God, and I'm trying to serve you, brother, sis Christ. I have to teach. I'm trying to. Patience. God's working me on that one. Mainly patiently waiting for him. i got to be patiently waiting. But I want the patience here, it's talking about in the context of being a servant to the Lord. we got to be patient when it comes to the catching away. 
the day of Christ. It's at hand, but we don't know when it's going to be. We can go home at any time. But patience here can also be talking about the brethren. When you plant seeds and you plant truth, we need to be patient. Maybe they're not ready for the truth yet. I've had brethren that disagree with me strongly, butting heads, and I was patient with them. I was respectful. And they came back later going, you were right, brother. I mean, the word is right. When I'm right, it's because the word's right. When I'm wrong, it's because I don't line up with the word. That's how it works. But they came back and said, yes, what you showed us in the word of God, that's right. That's right. There's time brethren have done that to me where it seems like I'm butting their heads. Like I'm the one that's being a little prideful. And they still have patience and show respect. And you know what happens? God shows me the truth and I'm like, brother, you were right. Patience. You plant the seed of truth. You, you make sure that this is the final authority. You plant the truth and you let God take care of the rest. Same thing with uh, witnessing. We always talk about that with witnessing. You plant seeds, someone else uh, uh, waters, and God gives the increase. The same thing with the brothers and sisters of Christ when it comes to preaching truth. When we start to have disagreements, you plant seeds of truth, the Word of God. Make sure you're using the Word of God. Someone else might come around and water what you plant and say, Oh yeah, they were right because this, 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 and this, and this. But it's God, through their personal walk with God, it's going to open their eyes to the truth. All right. Patience, verse 25. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. We're not supposed to be jerks. I've been a jerk before. Oh yeah, I've been a jerk before in the comment section. I've been a jerk to, when I had disagreements with the flat earth, I've been a jerk. Uh, the, the Trinity people, I've been a jerk before. Then I was kind of caught, God was kind of convicting me by then, and I was trying to be respectful, and that's how I was able to reach some of the brethren for the Godhead and got them to get rid of the, the pagan trinity. Um, but mainly, I was a big time jerk to flat earthers, um, a big time jerk to um, trying to think what is it, gap theory. Forgive me, I'm saying them a lot because I'm trying to think of these different theories. They're theories, so first of all, they're fables, it's not worth getting into a, a debate on any of that. But I've come across as a jerk to people before, brothers of Christ. We're not supposed to do that. And meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. We're not supposed to get into name calling and backbiting and whispering and mocking. Bearing false witness, railing for railing. We're supposed to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be an example. And that example is in meekness. We're supposed to be meek. We're supposed to be humble. We're supposed to, be a, we're supposed to have power and authority through the word. But we're not supposed to come across as angry, bitter, prideful, vanity, envy. We're supposed; those aren't people that are good examples of Jesus of being a good uh, a, a good disciple and a good ambassador for Jesus Christ. And meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If, because when you do it God's way. If God preventually will give them repentance to the knowledge of the truth. And it's happened on both sides. I said it. I've seen brethren that come to me and say, you know what? You were, you lined up with the Bible and the Bible was right. I was wrong. There's times where they were the nice ones and I was the one button heads. And I had to come back and apologize and say, you know what? You were right. You lined up with the Bible. The Bible's right. I was wrong. When you do it God's way, you're going to reach people. When you don't do it God's way, you're only going to butt heads. You're only going to cause division. You're only going to cause friction. If you don't do it God's way. Verse 26, And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. That's our goal. That's my goal. This whole teaching series is to help you understand 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and the best thing you can take away is that we don't have to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. Stop looking for it. Stop getting distracted by the world as it's getting ready, as God's preparing the world for it. That's for them. That's for the lost world. For us, we're supposed to be focused on the mission at hand. Preaching the gospel. Living a life of Christ. Being a light to this dark world. Staying in the word of God every day. Studying the word of God every day. Praying every day. Singing a hymn every day. Exhorting the brethren as often as we can. Okay. Today, we're trying to help the brethren. When you're trying to help them, it's that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. I've always said this. 
when you go to rebuke or correct someone, brothers in Christ, especially if you're in ministry, your heartfelt desire should be to build them back up. You're tearing down the bad parts, or you're, God's doing it through you, through His Word. You're tearing down the bad parts so they can be built back up with the good, the truth. When you correct somebody, God's tearing them down to build, and your heartfelt desire is to see them built back up. But there's some brethren out there through their hate and their bitterness and their anger and their pride and their envy and vanity. They want to see people just be destroyed, utterly destroyed. That's not how it's supposed to be, brother, says Christ. That they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Notice it says, but be gentle unto all men. This is both for preaching the gospel, how we're supposed to preach the gospel, and this is also how we're supposed to deal with brothers and sisters in Christ. The lost world, are they not in the snare of the devil? Oh, yeah. Brethren that are getting back into the flesh, back into the world, doing things Satan's way, they're getting back into the snare of the devil? Yeah. What's, our, what's my hope and desire? That they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Brothers and sisters, my whole desire is to see you guys get back to that standing position. We just read about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, the falling away. How some are going to depart from the faith in 2 Timothy. How some are going to depart from the faith. That falling away. Sometimes it seems like we're, we're dropping like flies, brothers of Christ. People are getting into the, uh, the flesh. They're getting into the world. I know brothers. I have, I've had brethren in my life that have just up and disappeared. They got into the world and pff, they're done with the Lord. As far as online, God's not done with them. It seems to me when a lot of people start getting into sin and worldliness, they tend to try to hide from the brethren because they don't want that exhortation. They don't want us pointing them to the scriptures because the scriptures are going to convict them. But that's my goal, brothers of Christ, to get you back to a standing point, to get your eyes back on Jesus Christ, and get back to living for Him with all your heart. With everything that's in you. All right. So I'm going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and thank you for your patience.